There's a lot of really, really good things we can do with our time. More, more good things than we have time to do. Of the choices made by humanity, to share one's gifts may well be the most surprising route to happiness and success. Gifts given and gifts received, each requiring a unique perspective to an opening where we find the opportunity of wonder. We bring you now on a journey with those who have discovered how to unlock the power of their unopened gifts. When you find yourself in a question of how to prepare for important events, or simple day-to-day -day life. Our guest in this episode may have the guidance and answers to better prepare you for life's inevitable ups and downs, or as I like to say, the inevitable wrapped gifts. Hello, I'm James McPartland. You can call me Mac. In this episode of Unopened Gifts, we hit the mat with a man by the name of Peter Vidmar. And we learn how this Olympian lived his life long before ever winning in a medal, and as I like to say, how he won a gold medal in the game of life. I want to help you understand how to implement the gifts presented in this program in your own life, and maybe you too can have a chance to change the world. Ill habits gather by unseen degrees. As brooks make rivers, rivers run to seas. We had a motto in our gym uh, that sounds silly, but it worked for us, and it was this. Practice as if it's competition, but compete as if it's practice. That means every day, what you do and how you do it matters. There's no, no such thing as just another day. Um, when, whenever I speak to an audience, I always say, practice makes, and they all say, perfect. And the real answer is, practice makes permanent. Because what you do over and over will become permanent behavior. So practice correctly. So when I was in the gym at the end of the day, and I'm tired and I'm beat, and I'm, I, I spent almost every day in the gym leading up to the games with Tim Daggett. Um, Tim's the announcer for NBC Sports. He's my roommate at UCLA. My, my oldest son, Tim's named after him. Tim's oldest son is named Peter. I know it's obnoxious, but we're good friends. He's a great guy. But, you know, we, we, we lived our dream together in that gym training. And at the end of the day, when we're tired, often, often, we'd be maybe on the horizontal bar. And it's the end of the day. And I'd say, hey, Tim, let's put some pressure on Let's just imagine it's the Olympics, it's the men's team finals, the U.S. team's on their last event of the night, it's the horizontal bar, and the last two guys up are Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar, and we've got only one chance to make our routine successfully, or we lose. And we're neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, we've got to win the gold medal. This is it. This one routine right now is the only one that matters. And here, we're exhausted. I've been in the gym for six hours, but I could close my eyes, I could vividly imagine I was in the Olympic arena, my heart would start to pound. And I'd look at Tim and I'd raise my hand and he'd raise his hand right back like he was the superior judge and I'd turn, face that bar and grab that bar and begin my routine. Sometimes I fell off the bar, I made a mistake. And that ruined my day because I placed importance in that performance. I, I imagined I fell off the bar at the Olympic Games. But if I made the routine successfully, I felt fantastic. And I would drive home every day after a workout like that and say, wow man, I just won the Olympics today, that was awesome, I'm doing it again tomorrow. And it got me excited. We did that every day, almost every day at the end of every workout. We would go through that scenario to try to picture in our minds that moment that may or may not come true. And jump ahead to the Olympic Games, and it's the final day of the team competition, it's the last event of the night, and the U.S. team's on the horizontal bar, and the last two guys up are Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar. We're neck and neck with the Chinese. We got one chance to make this routine successfully, or we're gonna lose the gold medal. Exactly what we, what we had practiced. And here we are, it was actually happening. But we were prepared. We had already gone through this mentally, and so, when, instead of signaling the Olympic judge, I'd imagine I was signaling Tim Daggett like to signal him at the end of every workout. And instead of standing, standing in that Olympic arena, I'd imagine I was back at that gym at UCLA, just doing one more routine at the end of the day. And I was able to, to take this very, very pressure-packed moment and create a new one for me based on prior experience and prior preparation. And so when I did the high bar routine at the Olympic Games, 
I honestly place myself mentally back in the old gym at UCLA. That's what I felt like when I did the routine. And, um, you know, landed the dismount and we were successful and won the team gold medal. Um, and that taught me a lot about visualization. It, it is very important to try to visualize what it is that you want to do long before you face that moment of truth. But not just visualize something. I think visualization is helpful, it's important, it's great, you know, how would I look? But I think it's more important to say, how would I feel? What am I going to feel in a situation like that? What would it feel like to accomplish that? What would it feel like to be an Olympic champion? And, and we, we are motivated more by feelings than we are by what we picture in our minds. And if I can somehow feel the emotion of being an Olympic champion, that's what gets me motivated and say, is that feeling worth working for? Not how would I, what would I look like, you know, who cares? How would I feel? And that's what would get me going. Because I could close my eyes and imagine being on that victory stand and having them place that gold on my neck and just the joy. And this is just daydreaming. The joy was incredible. I thought, I want to feel that. I want that to happen to me. And that's what motivated me, as opposed to picturing myself doing a great high bar routine. So um, if somehow we can capture the emotions of having accomplished something that's really meaningful to us, if we can do that, I think we'll be much more likely to put ourselves in the path to accomplish that more effectively. So what we learned from Peter is practice makes permanent. Our daily actions, our habits are ingrained by what he would call our practice. Every day is a practice session. To have a gold medal performance in life, you have to picture it, project it in front of you on the screen of life and not only see it in your mind, but feel it in your body. When that opportunity intersects with all of the practice, a gold medal opportunity unfolds before us. What Peter taught us time and time again throughout this entire program is it is all about practice, preparation, and visualizing what you want to have, feeling it in your body, and stepping forward to completion. I've been around uh, hundreds or thousands of world-class athletes. I can't think of one who really had it easy. Uh, you know, but we, we watch on television the finished product all the time. You're watching the Super Bowl, you're watching the Olympic Games, and you see them cross that line and they do it effortlessly. You know, their arms are raised in victory and they're fist pumping and they're pumped, they're excited, and they get the glory. And it, and, and sometimes, especially in a sport like mine where the goal is to make it look easy even if it's hard, um, you say, wow, he made it look so easy. And, and then some people might think, well, maybe it really wasn't that hard for them. Maybe it did come easily. And certainly there's some people that have innate physical gifts, you know, they've got good DNA. But behind every, every Olympic champion I've ever met is a story of hours and days and weeks and months of, and years of work and sacrifice and dedication and really unpleasant stuff and setbacks and injuries. And sometimes we hear about them and sometimes we don't know anything about them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm just so impressed by the story uh, behind their success because that's really what is that's the stuff of life, it's the process. It's not the finished product. So when you listen to Peter Vidmar's story, it's a story of perseverance. As he says and indicates many times, nobody has it easy. What tends to happen for us, the viewer, or the person in the stands, is we see that championship performance, we become enamored by it. What we don't see are the countless hours in the gym or on the field or the sacrifice from family or overcoming injury to get that person to the top of the podium. Peter would tell you, as he's told me many times, the victory isn't in the medal, the victory is in the journey to the medal. Opportunities are usually disguised as hard work, so most people don't recognize them. What you learn from Peter, and we'll expand on this later, is it's not important to manage time, it's important to understand priorities. To be rifle shot clear on your priorities. What Peter would tell you is if you're going to look at time, be precise. Allocate a certain portion of your time each day to your number one priority before you move on to the second priority. Many of us can make the mistake of being very active or confusing activity with accomplishment. That'll get us nowhere, it leads to frustration. Peter will get into how you really set priorities, how you allocate your goal structure, and how you make sure you have a sufficient amount of time to execute on that plan. So let's tune in now to Peter Vidmar, how he sets priorities, how he allocates time and resources towards goals, and how he went on to receive a gold medal. 
there isn't one person on this planet that has more than 24 hours in a day. And what are we going to do? How are we going to choose to spend our time? Because um, we write a check every day for 24 hours. Everybody does. We can write that check by wasting time. We can write that check by working our brains out. We can write that check by spending time with loved ones and family. But we write that check every day. And I have to ask myself, what's the best use of my time? And in the end, what am I going to look back and say, I'm really glad I spent my time doing this as opposed to that. Mm. You know, uh, we've always heard those sayings about, you know, how many people on their deathbed said, you know, I wish I would have closed one more deal. <laughs> wish I would have been in the office, spent, you know, another hour a day in the office, you know. Yeah. And, and certainly there's times that you have to spend that extra time in the office if you want to be productive in what you do. If you take too long in deciding what to do with your life, you'll find you have done it. With regards to how we spend time, I, I, I learned early on in my gymnastics training that um, a little bit of extra effort consistently on a regular basis adds up. Um, you know, I can't work twice as hard as the next guy or girl in the gym. Uh, I can't work twice as hard as my next competitor in gymnastics. But I can work 15 more minutes a day than I normally would put out. And 15 minutes a day every day for one year adds up to over 91 hours. And if an athlete trains for three hours a day in a sport, and he or she chooses to train an extra 15 minutes a day. After one year, that's an extra 91 hours. You know what? That's an extra month of training every year based on a three-hour-a-day workout schedule. I know that when I walk into any world championship competition, I always wished I had an extra month to get ready for it, but it was always too late. So those little extra efforts on a consistent basis really do add up. Um, and, and, and those moments of wasted time also add up. So we, we want to we plan our days wisely. But uh, don't ever say, gee, you know, what's 15 minutes a day? Pfft, that's going to have some major impact on my life, please. You know what? It can. It can on a consistent, on a consistent basis. It, it does add up. So I try to be mindful of moments of free time. How am I going to spend it? And, and it doesn't mean that you've got to be doing something all the time. It, it's important to relax. You've got to let go. You've got you to sharpen the saw sometimes. You've got to recreate. You've got to take a vacation. That's what keeps us sane. But have everything in its proper order and life's fun. So what clearly comes through from Peter is the concept that I call 24-7. You look at people who've accomplished great things in their life, no matter who it is, be it a Jonas Salk or Richard Branson, a Diana Nyad, a Peter Vidmar. One thing we all have in common, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's how we decide to deploy our time and energy within that framework of time. One of the things I find, and I've learned from Peter and i learned from some of the greats, that we often don't make time for is thinking. Thinking and planning. I was taught a long time ago, never begin a day until you finish it on paper. Peter talked about, I never walked into the gym until I knew it was scheduled, I knew exactly what I was gonna do. Otherwise, we waste time and we react to the day as opposed to responding to the day. Now, some people ask me, well, how do I know what my priorities are? First thing I say is, trust your gut. Trust your instinct. And if for some reason the message is fuzzy, ask people who know you. As a matter of fact, some other people know you better than you know yourself. Third thing I would add is a values exercise. Now people say a values exercise, what could that be? If I was to ask anybody at any point in time to pull out a piece of paper or tell me what their five highest values are, I would tell you most people would struggle. I struggled. And the purpose behind this is to understand what drives our actions, what creates our behavior, what creates our identity, who we are. When one looks at their value structure, they come to find what drives those actions, those behaviors. And for example, in my case, years ago, I had stressful experiences in my life. Most of us do. I couldn't put my finger on what it was that was bothering me. I went through this values exercise and I learned out of all the choices I had between really understanding what was most important to me, freedom was number one. Now at the time I had freedom, health, wealth, love, generosity, and those were things that perpetuated my actions, that made me feel empowered, that gave me fulfillment. But the one thing I learned was the things that inspired me were also things that caused me pain. And one of those values was violated, if you will. Number one for me was freedom. I couldn't understand what it was causing me conflict in my life when I come to recognize that freedom was being violated. If someone was imposing on my time, if somebody asked me for a favor, if traffic was going to prevent me from getting someplace, if an airplane was delayed, if someone was going to tell me what to do, that was causing me more stress than I would have normally understood as to why I was feeling stressed. What I learned was that was of high importance to me. And when I realized that story in my head about conflict, 
I was able to reframe it and look at freedom as a, as a positive, as an empowering way. So when you look at your values, and I strongly encourage people to pick your five highest values at the moment. Look for things that validate those values, that reinforce them in your life, whether they are something you are participating in yourself or you see it in other people, because you'll know when you see that value in action. The same token, if you see stress within yourself or other people, or if you see two people in conflict, those are values conflicts, two people trying to be right. When you see something, in my case, freedom, if I see that violated, it causes me stress, even if it's not me. It interferes with what was the most important priority for my, me in my life. So if I come back to Peter, we all get 24 hours a day, seven days a week, focusing on priorities. Minutes matter. He even said if you added 15 minutes a day to his workout routine, over the course of a year, that's an extra month, an extra month of competition to give him a chance at being a gold medal performer. Further, I know Peter is a man who lives his values, family being the highest, in a way that is beyond admirable. Five children he was raising as he was down the path to become an Olympic gold medal champion. He never missed a birthday, never missed a soccer game. He missed a lot of sleep, but he knew what his values were. He knew what he wanted. He knew why he wanted it. He wasn't sure how he was going to get there, but he surrounded himself with the people that were going to take him down the path to Olympic gold. Make a list of everything you got to do every day. Not in order of importance, make the list. Okay, of all those things, what are the A's? What has to be done today? Uh, and what are the B's? What are the things that should be done today? And what are the C's that you'd like to get around to if you have the time? Okay, now let's go back to the A's. Of all those A's, what's the most important one that you really got to focus on right now? A1. What's the next one? A2. What's the next one? A3. B1, B2, B3. And then all of a sudden, after 10 minutes of reflection and planning, I just mapped out my whole day. And, and, and in, that, in that grouping of A's and B's and C's is leisure time, it is fun, it is relaxation, it's lunch with a friend. It doesn't have to be a task that, that, that's not fun. Um, but uh, if we do that, it just, it just makes it easier to kind of tackle the day. And sometimes we kind of wake up in the morning and shoot from the hip, hoping it's going to turn out okay. I never did that in gymnastics. I had a plan every day when I walked into the gym. And that's what helped me to be an Olympic champion. So if it worked in that area of my life, it's probably going to work in other areas too. A man may be so much of everything that he is nothing of anything. When I was younger, when I was in college, I could afford to spend all my time on me. I was in college, I had my school and studies to worry about and my gymnastics training to work out. When I became a husband and a father, I realized that um, if I were to put all my efforts into my career, that other things would take a back seat, and I wasn't willing to make that sacrifice. So my challenge then became not, what's the next big thing I'm gonna put all my energy into? The challenge was, how can I find the right balance in my life? And, and to try to be good at everything that I do, but find the balance. And I found that in finding the balance, I become better at the things that I could have focused more on because I kept everything in perspective. Uh, it helped me to put more focused attention on something for a period of time, knowing that I was going to be done with that after a certain time so I could focus on my family or my children or my child's sporting event uh, or my volunteer service. And so I, I think as we get older, the bigger challenge is finding balance uh, in, our, in our lives because I think that's where we find real peace. One of the most powerful aspects of listening to Peter is the concept I call story. You know, your life is your story and your story is your life. All day long, we're in conversations with ourselves, asking and answering questions, justifying things, making decisions. And what Peter amplifies in this version of story is how he had to learn to ask himself empowering questions. If we go back to the concept of values, Peter's value to be a world-class athlete, a physical specimen, if you will, was very clear by his Olympic journey or his athletic pursuits. But then he expanded his values and included family. So let's just say he magnified his values. Now most on one of those paths would say there's no room for the second. Now that is actually a closed-minded way of looking at the game of life. What Peter does for us is he teaches us the power of asking empowering questions. Not why can't I, but how can I? If I'm going to pursue Olympic gold and be a father, and be a husband, and be whatever else he decided to be, he had to ask himself the questions to find a way to find the solutions within himself to proceed down that path to victory. 
he also does something that I don't think he expanded on here, which is worth talking about. He practices the Olympic art of saying no. Many times we let our mouth overload our backs. When we set priorities, there are only so many number ones we can have in our lives, and there's probably a top two or three at best. It's being willing to say no to the things that will interfere with what we want to have happen in our life is one of the most powerful things that Peter Vidmar gives to us. And finally, he gives us a gift I'll call adversity. Now you learn in Peter's story that one of the most motivating things for him day in and day out was the story of his father. His father was a victim of polio, made it very difficult for his father to get around, to walk much less. Now the days that Peter was in the gym, seven days a week, hours upon end, wanting that extra 15 minutes or whatever it took to beat whatever country it was to take him to the podium, he was tired often, fatigued, injured, he never talked about it. And when he had the courage to say to his father he did not want to proceed, he'd catch himself. Because if he didn't have the time to go into the gym, it was hard to say that to a man who couldn't walk. Adversity is probably one of the best teachers you'll ever come across in your life. In a setback is a gift. If you ask yourself an empowering question, what can this mean? What can be good about this in my life? And how can I use this setback as a force for good? you might find the key to your own values, the key to your own priorities, and your path to Olympic gold. You know, it's not fun, but I think the greatest gift that God has given me is adversity and setbacks. And I haven't had tremendous adversity, but whenever I faced a challenge in life and have had to somehow figure out a way to overcome that challenge, I've learned more about myself, much, much more about myself and what my capacity is than when something came easily for me. And, and, and I've observed that, of course, in other people, like my father and, and other, other individuals that have really inspired me. And, and so um, just know that to really do something meaningful, it, it might get messy. It might not be a smooth road. And, and when we face those moments, we have to say, oh, this is one of the, we have to recognize it for what it is. This is, this is one of those moments that, that we've been told could be a defining moment for me. Okay, now I've got to, I've got to take this on. It, it, identify, it at that, it, identify it for what it is and then tackle it and, and, and take it on. Because if we run away from it every time we face something like that, we're never really going to grow the way that we could grow or the way that I think God intended us to grow. Um, and so uh, it just, the problem is, is a lot of that stuff's not fun. It just isn't fun. But when we, when we get to the other side, we go, wow, I don't ever want to do that again, but I sure am glad I went through that. And, and that really, really has inspired me to see people that have done that and and when I've when I've experienced that maybe on a, on a micro level in my little world my little life I too look back and say you know that wasn't fun but I sure learned a lot I sure learned a lot I'm a better person because of it so of all the things we get from Peter Vidmar one that comes ringing true to me is the concept of values understanding your highest priorities your most important values can be the foundation to support your life priorities focus is key Action is vital in leveraging time. We all get 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How we deploy our focus and our energy will lead to the results that we hope to get in our life. So it's perseverance. You know, you got to see Peter on the podium having a medal put around his neck. What doesn't happen on those television programs or when we watch Wide World of Sports or whatever brings that to us is the countless hours of time, energy, focus, dedication, setback, injury, self-doubt that he had to push through that all of us have to push through to get to where we ultimately want to go. It's about managing our story. All of us have a gift. You have a gift. The opportunity within this program is to recognize that gift. And the great thing about Peter's gift is he knew he had to give it away. As you look at your own gift and identify what your gift is, what's very interesting about the gift concept is you can't give it away unless you own it. But you don't get to keep it unless you give it away. So what's your gift? What are you going to do about it? We don't know in that game of 24-7 how much time we have. So as we wrap up and you think about your gift and the opportunity to give that gift away, now is the perfect time to start. Tomorrow is not promised. Last year I had an opportunity the day before Thanksgiving to bring my brother across the country into California and spend a considerable amount of time with my family and myself. Part of that time was going to be dedicated to his healing. He had battled addictions, something that gripped him for almost 48 years. I was convinced that if he spent some time with my family in a new environment, that perhaps we'd give him access to some resources to shift his life, to get him on a path to make a difference in the life of other people 
who were also trying to overcome addiction. Within one hour of picking him up from the airport, as I was driving him to my home with my young children, my brother had a massive seizure and passed away in the vehicle. His time was gone, like that. Now certainly I had plans for him, and maybe he had plans for him, but somebody else had bigger plans for him. The point being, we don't know much, how much time we have. The only time to get started is now. The obstacles will always be there. Adversity will always be there, but only you know what your gift is, what your purpose is, how to use that to the best of your ability, and how to make a difference in other people's lives with what you've been blessed with. I implore you to do it now. You don't know how much time you have, and I know you're gifted. Thanks for tuning in. Mm -hmm.